Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful session of MB Analytical. Today, I am with, with Nupur Gupta, um, and we're going to talk about secrets of to create a, the most compelling MB application overall. Um, before I go any forward, let me introduce my, my panelist. My panelist is Nupur Gupta. She is uh, a Wharton grad uh, and, and founder of, uh, of Crack the MBA. It's a boutique consulting firm. Nupur is also uh, the president of elect of AGAC, twice president elect Nupur, right? Right now? Uh, yeah, I'm the I'm the president. Yeah, that's the, correct. Thank you so much, Raja. And and uh, one of the few people who've been elected uh, to this post twice. And uh, and most recently, Nupur um, was was awarded the most promising leader of um, of 2021 by the by the Economist. And I want to uh, share um, this this screenshot over here where. Uh, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, this is, and you said this happened just this week. This was literally yes. fresh, uh, fresh off the oven or so. Yes, absolutely. And this is by the Economic Times. Thank you so much for that, Raja. Uh, an amazing brand, um, I, I must say. So, so Nupur, um, in this session, we want to talk about secrets to create a, the most uh, a compelling MBA application. And you've been doing this for very long, for a very long time now. So um, how has the, the, the landscape changed over the last decade or so with regards to you know, what was a compelling application 10 years ago versus what is it now? And, and essentially, how has the competition changed for, for our, you know, just in general, for Indians and, and, and for Europeans? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the question, Rajat. And uh, first off, I really want to thank you, the EG Mad team, and our audience uh, for joining us in this session. It's a huge pleasure to participate today. Um, and uh, and you know, EG Mad always brings the most useful sessions for applicants, and it's really a great service that you and your entire team is providing. So thank you so much for that. Well, we just bring the people. It's you guys who, who do make them useful. <laughs> but yes, um, uh, well, thank you for for taking the time out for this. Um, and and so yeah, let's talk about how has this landscape changed. Yes, yes, absolutely. Happy to talk about that, Rajat. Uh, so, uh, Rajat, I started Crack the MBA in 2012. And uh, uh, even prior to that, I have been involved in the admissions landscape informally and also through my own MBA application journey. And what I have noticed is that there have been a few changes which have been coming about gradually but they certainly have been prominent and they seem to be here to stay. So I, I'll talk about a few trends. Of course, you know, those are not uh, the only trends, but, you know, definitely some that have been gaining prominence trends, over the years. Basically. Absolutely, absolutely, Rajat. Uh, so uh, one of the things we've increasingly been, uh, been seeing is that video has been gaining ground in evaluation. And uh, what I mean by that is we're increasingly uh, seeing that schools are asking for video evaluations as part of the application submission process, um, be it uh, impromptu video essays that are asked once candidates have submitted applications. Uh, for example, Kellogg, Yale, these schools do that. Uh, or it could also be a video evaluation that could be asked for uh, once you're invited to interview. Um, and finally, another way in which we're seeing video being requested for is, uh, for example, when you're placed on the wait list, uh, Booth uh, is known to have done so. So, so that's one of the trends that we've increasingly been seeing, and it's certainly been gaining ground. Uh, there's also when a you say gaining like, ground, more and more schools are asking for it now. Absolutely, have you absolutely. seen that an increased uh, incidence of that happening? Yes, absolutely, Rajat. Have certainly seen that in the past. Uh, we primarily had, uh, you know, University of Toronto, Rotman, uh, mm -hmm. Kellogg, and Yale. Those were sort of the early movers to have started this trend. Now we're increasingly seeing more schools like LBS, INSEAD. Uh, then we're also seeing a school like MIT Sloan that uh, asks you to submit a pre-recorded video as part of the application process. So you, that's not an impromptu video, but at the mm -hmm. same time, that's still a video evaluation. 
so so that's one trend which i wanted to talk about uh then um you know some other trends that we've been seeing and i i think you'd be uh, very familiar with that and even more so than uh, me on my side is uh, you know we're seeing improved test scores uh, you know as a data point uh, back in 2008 a uh, 700 level gmat score would be considered uh, the 92nd percentile whereas the same would now be i believe the 88th percentile Uh, right, uh, Rajat, and correct me if I'm wrong. I know your uh, data analytics is, yes. uh, you know, bang on with uh, thousands of data points. Uh, so what what we're seeing is that uh, candidates are increasingly relying on uh, expertise with providers like EGMAT, right? And they're really getting the best coaching possible, and that's also enabling them to secure greater test scores. Of course, candidates are more willing to take the tests uh, more Multiple number times. of times. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, all of these factors are contributing to uh, higher test scores. So that's something we're definitely seeing with, and that uh, reflects in the averages. Um, so that's another point that I wanted to talk about, and uh, another thing which I wanted to talk about is uh, increased competition um, with applicants being more willing to seek admissions advising services from consulting firms like Crack the MBA. So we're certainly seeing that candidates are better prepared, and uh, and you know that that's definitely something that increases the competition. um and finally one other trend which i wanted to talk about which is more recent is is um increased availability from admissions officers and schools which has been aided in a small part by covid and schools is mm-hmm. willingness to pivot to virtual events so we're we're just finding that the access that candidates have to schools and admissions officers students uh that has gone up significantly so um you know those are some of the trends which i wanted to touch upon so i think when to talk about number 4 and number 1 you talked about video you talked about tesco you talked about the competition um uh because more and more people are availing admission consulting services and then the increased availability uh, uh that that b schools have so because of four specifically because b b schools are now more available to engage with students um, admission officers are willing I mean, they're hosting all of these virtual events um have you uh, and have you seen that a the quality of um, the expected quality of applications that b schools have now for let's say an mit a wharton your wharton alumnus um you know a kellogg that has gone up you know something that worked in 2012 which would be considered a winning application is probably not going to be a winning application in 2021 thanks for the great question rajat uh, so uh, of course the data that i would have access to on my side would be more limited so i would not want to present this as a fact right because the kind of access that admissions officers themselves have is certainly uh, you know thousands of data points versus yeah. on our side um, however just with the limited data that i would have had access to what i can certainly share is that candidates are a lot more prepared uh they're starting the process much earlier they're spending much more time on their applications and in general the preparedness is much higher so that's something that i'm certainly uh, noticing then what we're also seeing is that even in the interviews right there's there's just like a lot more preparation that candidates are going in with in fact Uh, i'm routinely hearing from candidates how the interview prep that they're doing for their business school applications with crack the mba that's enabling them significantly in their internship interviews as well so it feels like the thresholds just higher and uh, while while it's hard for me to specifically comment on wh- what would have won in 2012 it would or would not have won now uh, mm-hmm. but I, if i had to take a guess if i had to speculate i would say i would expect that to be the case uh, so yeah in general this is a very much a subjective point i agree with that i think it's it's very much subjective i actually see from my side people are 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 um, asking students are asking more questions not just about the gmat prep part of it but also okay um 
they're not going just by ranking. I see more and more people thinking more about, okay, which school do I want to go to? And, 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 and so you talked about the timeline. Let's kind of go to that. So, um, sure. so, so what is that timeline that, that one should have to, to, when you're applying to a top business school with regards to, Hey, this is when, um, uh, you know, I should be done with my GMA. This is how I sh- when should, when I should start research for a B school and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, and, and and in general, this notion of X days at a bare minimum versus, I mean, what's the reality versus, you know, what what uh, what people think in your opinion, and what's the ideal timeline? Let's kind of start. With fair that. enough, fair enough. No, thank you for the great question, Rajat. And this is something that I routinely see applicants grappling with. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, you talked about an ideal timeline. I will caveat and preface my comments with uh, the fact that. Uh, you know, different strokes for different folks. However, I will talk about what I think could be an effective way to set the process up. Uh, So uh, personally, what I recommend is uh, getting done with the test first, you know, the GMAT or the GRE. Um, And honestly, I've had candidates come to me uh, who had the test done two years in advance and they enroll uh, you know that early they enroll two years in advance so that also enables them to work through their candidacy and seek inputs mm-hmm. on opportunities they have and be more intentional in their approach um, and so with the candidates i've seen who've done that i've actually found them to have stellar outcomes uh, they've been very very motivated and they've also uh, had an opportunity to really really work on their profiles meaningfully i completely understand they've been preparing that's for not... this, right for, if someone's been doing yeah. that for two years they've been working on those <laughs> leadership uh, 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 scenarios they've been taking on more responsibilities i think yes it makes sense yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you might wonder that, you know, hey, not everyone has uh, the opportunity to do so. So uh, for candidates who are starting in the year in which they plan to apply. So let's say if people who are applying this year. Right. Uh, so I, I would suggest that they get done with the test as soon as possible. As a general rule of thumb uh, at Crack the MBA, we recommend that applicants give themselves around three months to prepare four to five MBA applications. And Mm -hmm. specifically if engaging with a coach or a consultant, because there's also some time involved in just understanding the candidacy, the back and forth involved, the iterative process. Uh, So that's the general rule of thumb that we say. And this is after you've done, you're done with the tests. Um, so and that's that's a, that's a great point over there. So so uh, just going back to the first point that you said, you know, people get done with the test a year in advance. I think Sharang's case, who you worked with, was is a great example of that, where Sharang was done with the with his test in uh, 2019, and then he worked with you in 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 um, in in what, what? No, he was done with the test in 2018 or or so, a year before this. So yeah. just. Uh, for Sharang's story, he he got a 740. He worked with an admission consultant in his first year. He couldn't get in anywhere. And then he worked with Nupur and he got a total of $280,000 worth of scholarship and multiple admits. Um, and, and Karthik, if you can share Sharang's... Um, uh, we actually had a debriefing session with Sharang as well. And, and you can really see how he built his candidacy uh, and how he has those leadership experiences in that second year. And that's kind of building your profile and, and it turned out really well for him. Uh, right now so let's talk about those three months that you said you know you you need about three months after you're done with the gmat so those three months are for about but four to five applications how long does the first school take i mean is there some sort of a uh, i mean is, is it is it like two months to that first school or so on and so forth or is it kind of linearly laid out Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Uh, so, Rajat, I would uh, not necessarily say that it's two months for one school because what basically happens is definitely there's a fixed uh, time period involved where, you know, there's a lot of front loading, running. right? There's a lot of yeah, front, front loading. loading. Exactly. Exactly. You said it right. Uh, so, there's some front loading involved. At the same time, soon after commencing, uh, you know, work on one application there is an ability to commence another application in parallel. And in fact, like I would go as far as saying there's candidates who also work on even more schools in parallel. Uh, And the process somehow almost demands it because the essays come out fairly late, you know, end of May or even early June. So 
that sort of becomes the bottleneck, so to speak. If the SAS came out earlier, that would actually be a huge enabler for candidates. Hmm. So, so if let's just there's the people over here, and we have about 70, 80 people in, in here right now. And, and for them, what you're really saying is if you're done sometime middle of May and considering round one is what's it? September, you still can apply to four, three to five, four to five schools in round one if you're as long as you're done with middle of May or so. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's good. Now that we have that reference timeline, um, what are the, what is the first set of questions that a, the candidate must answer, uh, which is regardless of whichever school they plan to apply to, to really say, hey, am I? What what, what candidates about themselves should they answer, and what do you ask them if someone's got to work with you? Right, right. No, thank you for the question, Rajat. Uh, so uh, there's a few things which definitely come to mind. Uh, so uh, one is just understanding the exposure that the applicant has to the MBA landscape, right? So understanding if they've done significant research in advance, if they've had colleagues, friends, and family members who've gone for their MBA. Uh, so that potentially gives them a leg up in their research. So uh, that's also useful if people have less time. Uh, mm -hmm. Then another thing to understand is the clarity that they have with respect to their future career path. Uh, so that that can be extremely useful. Uh, then, uh, then what I'm also looking to understand is why does somebody want an MBA really? Uh, how will the MBA be a contributor for somebody in advancing in their career and, uh, you know, just arriving at the outcome that they see for themselves? Uh, and then understanding what evaluation criteria they have in selecting the schools that they wish to apply to. Uh, and also understanding how their candidacy compares to past candidates who've been admitted uh, into those kind of schools, understanding their leadership uh, background and also the kind of international experiences they've had, as well as their academic background. So basically, like their uh, undergraduate GPA, the test scores, if they have access to those. And, and how they've progressed in their careers. So, you know, I, I know that those are like a lot of different points, but just wanted to share a few well, things. This is, this is, this is great information. So what you're really saying is even before you really just say, hey, I'm going to apply to Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Keenan Flagler, Ross, uh, um, Georgetown, well, you have to really see, you have to have this, this initial package prepared where, where you say, okay, you know, this is my background. This is kind of, um, profession that I've had. Uh, these are the leadership experiences I've had in this. These are my test scores. These are my undergrad GPAs. And based on this, you would give them an idea as to how do they compare to to some of the folks who have gone to various set of schools. So, so is that something that you do once you have this piece over there for people who work with you? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I think definitely. And I, here I want to preface my comment with saying that I don't believe I know best in terms of where somebody can get in. I absolutely certainly don't. Uh, however, based on this information, we can uh, get a sense for whether or not the portfolio of schools that mm -hmm. the candidate is targeting, if, if that seems realistic based on what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. And the past can predict the future, but uh, it does not uh, prevent new possibilities. So that's something that I, I feel very strongly I, about. So I wanted to mention I, I, that. I agree with that. I think it's just the past yeah. is one of the best predictors that we have for, for the future. Think about your GMAT yeah. scores, all those percentiles you talked about, it's all built on past data, right? Yeah. If, if suddenly yeah. everyone became super smart, that 760 would probably be an 85th percentile, not a, uh, <laughs> not a 99th percentile. So, yeah, uh, yeah. But, no, but that's yes. a great point. That's a really uh, wonderful point. And in fact, uh, there uh, there are many cases where uh, somebody might have a parameter which does not necessarily fall within what we've seen in the past. At the mm. same time, the candidate may have an awareness of the same and they would still be willing to take a chance and just to bet on themselves, right? Uh, in a manner where they're like, let's say, balancing out their entire portfolio. And yet they're also applying to schools that you know are really giving them a shot at like a dream school 
and mm-hmm. i personally i encourage that approach i think that's a really good approach uh, because then you're focusing on the entire portfolio it's sort of like uh, with investments right uh, you don't want to concentrate too heavily in one direction so i i look at this as something similar. you also have to push yourself right you have to really say hey let me let me challenge myself life's no fun yeah. without a challenge yeah yeah and and honestly when those outcomes uh come to fruition it is i cannot even tell you how fulfilling it is just um, you know hearing from candidates who who literally have tears in their eyes goosebumps it's mm. uh, fascinating i i absolutely agree and I mean, imagine that person who's really said hey uh uh you know what was a dream school i got into what and imagine the kind of energy that person would be going in when person goes into what and, and you know the 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 outcomes out of what and consequently would be would be that much better so so yes i can yeah imagine. absolutely yeah like uh, specifically you know you mentioned what you know one uh, candidate that comes to mind is somebody from a rural background in india from the state of haryana and mm. this person did not even uh you know could not even write in english prior to like 10th grade and then just the way they persevered and they joined the call center to learn english and just the way they toiled wow. to make the mba reality and eventually uh, landing up at wharton uh, just like their la- life the career it's at a different trajectory altogether so you know those stories make you really happy and 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 yes i mean you might really say a traditional person would say call center doesn't make sense but for this candidate it's a huge jump from not knowing english till 10th grade and and, and yeah. then if you especially if you do well at a call center this is this is a tremendous uh, achievement so so with that let's kind of go to the various components you know an mba application especially you know usb schools uh, european b schools and isb in india um uh, is a very sophisticated application compared to what people are traditionally used to with regards to indian b school so they they have you know you have your resume you have your essays letter of recommendation you have all of these general questions that 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 come and you also have the interview and you talked about the video essay now so what i mean what how do these kind of paint a holistic picture of 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 an individual in, in your opinion i mean do they have specific roles that they play uh, are there overlapping roles across i mean how do you approach mm-hmm. this fair enough uh, no thanks for the question rajat uh, so i i'll talk about some of those components which you touched upon uh, so you talked about the essays right i was one of them uh, i i believe essays are crucial in helping candidates differentiate themselves from their peers and in conveying their personality to schools uh, for some candidates in fact essays can be as significant as make or break factors this is not true for all but for some candidates uh, you know because they can present themselves and express themselves in a way they just cannot through the other components uh, so so essays I, for example this uh, so so just like for example even with the candidate that i was just talking about right with the guy uh, so just with looking at this who didn't know english till 10th grade who went to a college exactly center. absolutely and you know like just looking at his resume uh, you know the undergraduate institute was like not well known maybe he might have even been the first candidate from that institute to attend wharton uh, the uh, the score he had there was not necessarily exceptional the essays truly allowed him to express the background that he came from and express the way he sort of uh, what were the trigger points for him in making the different moves that he did which actually provided a much better understanding for how he thought about things and you know we could really really imagine the way he would go about approaching his future as well he he became somebody who started a new club at wharton and really really contributed to the community and that's something that we could not have expressed without the essays so you make a very important point which is which is that when you think about a resume you have a set template when you think about a letter of recommendation yes there's freedom there but you have a set template but the essays are like a blank canvas so which is where if you have the unique things that you have the, the, the essays are the best place to 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 start expressing them and set context so that you know the, the resume and the letter of recommendations then can be seen in those contexts Mm-hmm. right right uh, i think that's a great point uh, rajat uh, that yeah the essays truly allow you to express unique aspects 
and you as rightly said it provides you a blank canvas which the resume the application form the letters of recommendation they don't necessarily provide you those opportunities so uh yeah and that's special context very context can be set really well in there i think that's really good yes yes yeah there is some restriction with the kind of questions that each school asks and i actually i want to share uh, an important point here so one thing which we notice even in working with candidates across schools is that the same person could look very different from one school versus the other just simply based on the the space available to them with the application questions the essay questions yeah in seed versus uh, hbs probably <laughs> right right yeah so the different schools the ross uh, essays for example so yeah i think different schools provide different opportunities and that can make a huge difference in the outcomes as well so I, and then i know we didn't have this question to discuss on the list of questions that we had but does that also indicate if you a school has a certain sort of certain kind of questions since you allude to this does that also indicate in some ways what qualities a schools looking for when when you think mm -hmm. about the other questions mm -hmm. yeah absolutely rajat i think that's a wonderful connection uh, i do feel that uh, schools do structure their essay questions to be in line with the qualities that they are seeking as well Uh, and that uh, you brought up in CIAD, so you know certainly the essay questions do bring up traits that the school values. For example, international motivation, leadership, academic potential. So uh, you know it's it's really a great point that you bring up and a wonderful connection. Okay, so I want to add this point. I want to talk about uh, uh, our, our, our because different people would say, "Hey, which school makes sense for me?" And we're gonna. some of it we're going to talk about over here but i think people can also benefit a lot from um, our mb analytical series that's going on where uh, what we do is we actually bring in candidates from various backgrounds and these are our former students and we discuss hey how did they get into a certain school we already had about eight sessions this is actually the eighth session that we have um, and 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 we have some some upcoming sessions uh, next week we have malvika who's gotten into insiad um, then we have a husband and wife uh, gotten to johnson over there um, and shaker who's got who got to uh, unc and then he's um, is now working at microsoft is going to talk about that entire journey uh, shamir lbs ayush columbia and then uh, farman we have talks that's in the next sort of what six sessions or so and then we have you folks from wharton and harvard uh, following that as well so um, definitely register for this uh, uh for these sessions if you've not and um we also have some upcoming webinars for those if you want to get done with that gmat we have an rc webinar this weekend uh and then uh, we have a quant workshop this weekend as well so saturday and sunday if you've not registered for those uh definitely do that so with that nupur i think some really interesting pieces so let's kind of transition into this um so you've talked about the various components in the the this roles that they have um what do you first work on i mean when you work with a candidate and and why is that out of the resume the essays the lors you know which component do you start with and and why is that mm -hmm. absolutely and and those are some exciting sessions that you have lined up rajat uh, wow i wish i was applying i'd have access to such great resources thanks to you <laughs> so well, you uh, getting do, back get one of a few of you <laughs> and do those uh, do do these okay. sessions Yes. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and all right. So back to your question. Uh, you we talked about uh, the essays in terms of the components, mm -hmm. and the others not as much. Uh, however, what we're talking about here is what component to tackle first, perhaps. Well, what do you get started then, with? I mean, yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. So for purely tactical reasons, I would advise uh, applicants to work on the resume first. Uh so the reason i would suggest that is because you're not waiting on external information in order to commence that so you have everything that you need in order to start working on those uh and uh, the, the resumes can be extremely helpful when you're also uh scheduling conversations with students alumni oftentimes they do ask for a resume 
so even as part of your research, uh, it, it's helpful to have a working resume, a strong resume that you can share with people to make a good first impression. Uh, and some schools also ask you to submit a resume and get feedback on your candidacy. So, so having a, a resume can be helpful. So an example of such a school would be London Business School, LBS. Uh, so and even before also, you apply, they ask you to submit a resume and say, hey, yes, should you even apply? Uh, not necessarily should you apply, but what are some factors that stand out for them? God. And they do is yeah. free of charge. They're not, you don't have to pay absolutely. money. Absolutely. 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 So it's a great, great, great service. And mm -hmm. also to apply to certain fellowships, a resume can be useful. Uh, so I, I do think that the resume is really what I would recommend that people start with. And and uh, then I would suggest starting work on preparing materials to share with your recommenders. Uh, because recommenders need time to write strong recommendations. And, and there as well, you want to give them enough time, enough heads up. And finally, I would start work on the essays. Uh, there's also the dependency, as I previously mentioned, on the schools where the essays sometimes get released like end of May or in June. Uh, so if applicants work on the other components and then start with the essays in, say, May or June, I think that leaves them plenty of time to uh, prepare strong applications. I, I agree with that. And I think it's just that these components, uh, especially the resume, it's a much more generic component uh, than, than, than the other components. So yes, I, I absolutely agree with, 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 with these. And I think a lot of brainstorming also happens on the resume. You get those leadership components out of it uh, when mm -hmm. you're getting that resume done too. Yeah. So, so um, we have some great questions and I want to address that. We are about 31 minutes into the session. Um, I also want to talk about a very important announcement. So, you know, as, 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 um, uh, as participants in this ecosystem where with test prep and, and admission consulting, one of the things that we like to do is to give back. And Nupur, I know you are giving back to the community. You have this wonderful uh, fellowship, the Daya Fellowship. Do you want to talk about... Um, who Daya is, why did you start this fellowship, and what it is, and how can uh, students make use of it or, or people over here uh, leverage that? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much for the great uh, opportunity, Rajat. I'm very, very excited about this fellowship. Uh, you asked a very important question for me personally, who mm -hmm. Daya is. Uh, we may have international candidates on this uh, uh, call as well. So I will share that Daya is a Hindi word which means kindness. And uh, Daya is the name of my late grandmother. I lost her last year. And uh, one of the things I've been experiencing is that we need more kindness in this world. We need empathy and love with all that we've all gone through in the past year or so. Uh, I, I've certainly uh, you know, been left wanting for more kindness and love. And the idea here behind fellowship, which is named after my late grandmother, Daya, the uh, Daya Kindness Fellowship, is to promote kindness and uh, through uh, encouraging women the opportunity to express their leadership. So my grandmother, Daya, was an extremely kind and loving person, and she was also a great leader. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the premise here is to enable more opportunity for women to express mm -hmm. their leadership. So that's sort of the idea behind this fellowship. And it, it's open now. The application is currently open. It opened up just today, April 1st. And the application is open until April 15th. So uh, the eligibility criteria is all Indian female applicants who plan to apply to top MBA programs this year with application deadlines up till the end of January 2022 can apply for the fellowship. Uh, there will be one winner who would be selected post a round of interview. Uh, and the winner will be announced on April 30th. Uh, okay. And the winner will be able to secure admissions coaching support directly from me for up to five business school applications. And this is like 100% support. Um, and, uh, you know, to learn more about this program, the eligibility, uh, I encourage and invite all uh, attendees to visit uh, bit.ly slash uh, daya hyphen fellowship. I think we'll share more about. We'll share okay, the link thank you so much. 
So, so card, if you can, can we share the link? So, so just to to highlight this, so um, it's a it's open to to Indian women who are applying this year, round one mm -hmm. or round two, and it's it's um, I would say in B school terms, it's a full ride with for five schools, up to five schools, in in in, in that case. So it's it's, it's uh, yes. So um, and here is um, uh, he, I think there's the, the whole link is is also the right one, right? The crack the MBA slash their kindness fellowship. That's also the right way. I know you talked. About yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yes. That that works as well. Yes, that works as well. Yes, um, yes. So 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 yes, only till Jan of 2022, and and um, who knows? You know, Nupur might do an, another fellowship next year uh, for fall of 2022. But but yes, this is <laughs> just till Jan of 2022, and the results will be out. You can apply for the for till you said it's the seventh of April or sixth of April. Till the fifteenth, till the fifteenth of April. Fifteenth of so, April, and then so you'll have almost two weeks. Almost two yeah. weeks, okay, and you'll have the results out on the thirtieth. Yes, that is correct. So the process is: you apply, then you there'll be a filtration, and then you'll do a certain sort of interviews, and then you'll select one candidate or so. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank okay. you for uh, clarifying that, Rajat. Perfect. Uh, all right, so that that's wonderful. I I look forward to to hearing. Um, uh, who who you select and and I look forward to the the ultimate outcome after that. I think that'd be that'd be wonderful. Uh, we all need more kindness and and I think it's <laughs> it's, it's emancipation uh, uh, for 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 individuals who who can't afford these services. So so yes, yes, um, absolutely. So let's talk about this. Um, I think um, let's we talked a bit about the application components. I know there are a couple of other questions around it. Um, Let's talk about B school selection. It's it's a really, uh, I would say, convoluted, often confused topic. And 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 so, um, how should you? I mean, when you think about selecting a certain business school, your profile, your background, what you've been doing so far, and 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 essentially, how much does that matter? And then, how should you? What consideration should you have when you, when you think about selecting? Hey, these are the schools that I want to apply to. Um, Overall, and especially, I think so. Just Indians in general, Indian engineers uh, overall, or Asian engineers. I think it's there. All of them are overrepresented now um, overall. But but yeah, in general, what consideration should you have to to? to... Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Rajat. Uh, Rajat, I think one of the things that becomes really meaningful in determining the school that you wish to attend is identifying your future career path and your career goals, so to speak, uh, be it in the short term or in the long term. And the reason I place an importance on this aspect is because uh, having that clarity can also enable applicants to connect with like-minded individuals who are part of the ecosystem of that school, be it students or be it alumni. And by studying the paths that uh, uh, those uh, uh, students and alumni they have forged, that also would allow applicants to identify um, sort of their fit and if that's something that's meaningful to them. So that's one aspect that I wanted to share. Uh, then another aspect that I wanted to share uh, is the location. So that can be meaningful from the perspective also of uh, uh, one is, of course, your career, which you need to uh, focus on. So, for example, uh, a lot of times uh, folks who want to get into entrepreneurship, uh, they tend to be interested in being around Silicon Valley for people interested in finance. Uh, they tend to have a preference to be in and around New York City. Uh, so location can be important in that sense. Location can also be meaningful in some other ways. For example, the weather, uh, this a lot of times this is not a factor for Indian applicants. But um, even so, I do think that can be an important factor. You know, in Northeast, it, it, it tends to be like a lot colder and uh, Raja, yeah, a lot I, of people I'm don't sure recognize whether it's a factor until <laughs> they actually get there. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And it takes like spending some time there, right? Like if you've experienced the uh, 
uh, the cold in Chicago, in upstate New York, I think you can appreciate these aspects a lot more. Uh, so I, I do think that is a relevant factor as well. Uh, then I, I think one consideration which I sometimes see Indian applicants specifically take is their long-term plans in the sense that uh, for candidates who are interested in returning to India in the long term, then what they may also choose to focus on is the brand recognition that the school has because that will play into the opportunities they have and uh, along those lines, the network that the school might have in the home country. So that can be meaningful as well, because if you have you know, many individuals who've returned or there's like a strong network, there's also going to be a greater network effect and the ability to access more opportunity. So uh, you know, I, I think in that sense, that can be an important aspect. Then uh, some other things which uh, people look into are, for example, the class size. Uh, so we have some schools which may have really small class sizes of like 200, 300 individuals to schools like uh, Wharton, which Wharton and Harvard, which are like 900 and above. So uh, that can year, also. Right, right. So uh, that can also be an important factor uh, in the sense that, you know, whether it's an intimate offering or you have, you know, because of the number of people you have basically an opportunity to do anything and everything that you want to do, then you may also want to think about, you know, whether you are getting city exposure or if it's more suburban or rural. So that can be a factor as well. So for example, with like a school like Columbia or NYU, you're getting more of a city experience. Whereas with let's say a school like Cornell, which is in Ithaca in upstate New York, uh, you know, you're getting something more of like a suburban experience, if or, I may even call it talk. that. Which is like <laughs> of nowhere. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And even with some of those schools which are uh, more remote, I would say it's also relevant to sort of think about your recruiting opportunities. Uh, so with, for example, with Tuck that you talked about, right? Like at least you have access to a Boston, uh, which is mm -hmm. fairly close by. Uh, so I think those are some of the factors that I would look into. And then the... The network is something that I would really focus on because that's something, for example, with the school like Tuck, right? Uh, people are just so connected to the school that uh, alumni are really giving back. And that can be a real, real enabler in students' efforts and also later down the line when they become alumni. Uh, so the culture is also something that I would very much uh, look into. Yeah, I mean, I always have the statistic that, um, I mean, pretty much all top schools have great post-MBA employment statistics three months down. But yeah. with Tuck is the only school, I've been, through three, I've been through three recessions, you know, and Tuck's the only school where the post-MBA employment statistics have not even budged by a percent in during the past three recessions, including the current one that we went through last year. Mm -hmm. Um and, and 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 so I think I'd say unless and until you're looking for a job on Mars or Moon, you'd probably have a Tuck MBA to help you out there. <laughs> so so yeah. Uh, yeah, no, so, I I think Tuck's like really really phenomenal. In fact, like just this year, I have one candidate who uh, got into both London Business School and Tuck, and uh, the candidates actually chosen Tuck, uh, even though they started you out the process. Traditionally, think right. Yeah, so absolutely what? not. And 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 they started out with LBS as their top choice among all schools, and you know, Tuck just won them over. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes. So yeah. so yeah, like get to know the schools well, you know, through engaging with students, admissions officers, alumni. Really, really do that. So what is it that? If you are from an overrepresented pool, I mean, is there certain things that you should not do? I mean, or some of the mistakes that you've seen student candidates make when they apply to schools or go to the interview? Or... Okay, okay. Um, right, right. Uh, so just in general or like specifically for people from overrepresented? No, uh, in candidates? general. I mean, what are the, like if you were to say three things to avoid in A, your interview, B, your MB application, what would be those top three things? Okay, sure. Uh, so I would say that in your application, uh, get your names and dates right. 
So what I mean by that is don't name other schools and don't get your dates wrong in the resume specifically. That's something which seems to happen more often than one would think, which is not necessarily because people are trying to fudge uh, data, but simply because as you're like copy pasting like things, sometimes you may miss like changing a number here or there. And, and that's really uh, not, it does not reflect favorably on your candidacy. So that's something which strangely I see that very commonly. People uh, would say what is my top school while applying to Kellogg or applying that, to GSB Chicago. That, that, that also is something that we hear from uh, admissions officers as part of the AGA conference. We hear that, that that frequently happens where they get their names wrong. Uh, luckily, uh, on our end, uh, you know, we are able to catch that. So that that's something we can help uh, candidates uh, work on and fix. Uh, then, uh, you know, in terms of like the interview, I think uh, one thing which I would uh, then uh, another thing I would recommend is just focusing on the written communications. So that's something which I find that a lot of candidates uh, sometimes don't tend to focus on as much. And then in conversations, something might come up that, oh, hey, like uh, we wrote to this person and wrote in such and such manner. So I, I would say that, uh, you know, just being polite, brief and just getting your spellings, your typos right. I, I know these sound like small things, but I do no. still think it's meaningful. No, they're not <laughs> small. And, and I agree. I agree. I mean... Um, it's just it's very difficult to to write well and yeah. and, and 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 write in an engaging fashion and, and and to really say hey how do i how do i write so that i don't sound pushy and needy and and, yeah. and interesting yeah so yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and and there's one more which i wanted to mention rajat if i may uh, so don't register for events which you are unable to attend so that's something that I'm increasingly seeing that people tend to do. So that's something that I would recommend uh, that like, please only sign up for events that you can attend because in this digital age, it's increasingly easier to sort of track uh, whether or not uh, you've attended and you've registered and your uh, commitment to the program uh, could be called into question if you're doing that. So, so that's one other thing which I wanted to sort of talk about. Although I, I want to talk about that third and the second part. I want to just clarify one other thing on the second one. The written communication piece, what you're saying is, you're not saying don't do written communication. In fact, you encourage written communication. What you're really saying is, go about it properly, be careful about it, plan it well. And, yes, and, and absolutely. So, and then the third piece with regards to events, and, and, and I think that's very true. Um, don't register for an event if you can't attend it. Why? Because, you know, even if you're a good candidate, if you didn't attend it, you might not get that admission or you might not get that scholarship because um, remember this, at top B schools, uh, every seat is, is, is sought after, which means that someone who's pushing your name, uh, uh, there's for, for every one candidate, there's someone, another admission officer who's pushing another candidate, right? And and you don't want that other admission officer to really say, hey, this guy registered for this event. He may be a great candidate, but he registered for this event, didn't join us. So maybe he's not interested. You don't want, want that to happen. So so um, so yeah, so so definitely the, the three points, great advice. Uh, don't fudge stuff in your application. Uh, written communication, be very, very precise about it. In fact, I would just say this. If you have written communication, um, this is a piece of information which, on which, uh, in which you actually have. Um, I, I don't. I want. Don't want to use the word competitive advantage, but you don't have competition. Why? Because four other candidates who you may be competing against might not have written to the admissions committee. You have. So, so this is where, where, where I, I really like to say the best race is where you're in a car and the other guys are running. This is kind of where you are. If if others haven't written and you have and you've done a great job of it, you have an advantage there. And, and 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 so so I think definitely do it, do it well, and then events, attend them, ask questions if you have good smart questions over there. Uh, you, you, we, I, in in our opinion, what we've seen at AGAC, admission officers do remember people when they ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so absolutely, I think good questions are mm -hmm. uh, exciting, right? They're intellectually stimulating. Mm. And and it also shows the kind of research you've done and how excited you are about the school. 
So I uh, absolutely good question going in with good questions. I think that really, really uh, gives you an opportunity to make a favorable impression. Mm -hmm. uh, we will talk about, uh, I want to just, we have a lot of questions. We are about, about 50 minutes and I don't know how time went, but I want to just ask this one last question before we go to um, our viewers questions. Mm -hmm. And this is a question that everyone has, and it's a question that um, I get asked a lot. Okay. What difference does a consultant make? And I know okay. you you are a consultant, but but I think it's 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 an important question for for to to for everyone to answer because hey, everyone can say I can write this application by myself. But what difference do you make um, in in someone's uh, candidacy? Mm -hmm. Sure. Or sure. in position uh, someone's candidacy. Right, right. Uh, absolutely happy to answer the question, Rajat. Um, I think uh, admissions consultants can make a huge difference. Uh, I, I think of admissions consultants as coaches who are guiding applicants through the whole process of just understanding themselves better mm -hmm. and preparing themselves to uh, tell their stories and connect the dots in a meaningful and compelling manner. And at the same time, positioning themselves for future career success. So I, I think of a strong uh, admissions consultant as playing all these different roles. And having an admissions consultant who's available to constantly coach you, uh, you know, over a period of weeks and months, I think can be a huge differentiator, even in uh, competitive sports, right? Uh, we have... Uh, people like uh, Virat Kohli, Sachin Tendulkar, like who are prominent Indian batsmen, uh, you know, they all have sought coaches, even when they've had, a, even with the possession of sheer talent. And I think through this process, having coaching is extremely meaningful. Even for me, I, I think I'm a decent writer. And at the same time, when I'm writing something, I need feedback on whatever I've written, even authors, right? They need editors as well. And you need somebody who can provide you coaching, who really understands you, your strengths, your weaknesses, and can coach you through the process and guide you in just uh, having that uh, transformational growth, which can also allow you to make the most of business school once you even get in. So I, I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal process, which is not just about getting into business school, but also making the most of it. That's a really good response, uh, I, I, and and I am I'm, I'm, and the, the the parallel that you you had with 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 players using coaches. I think the reason why players have coaches is because they have talent. I mean, if you if you think you have talent, if you you need a coach to refine that talent, because again, uh, and 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 even though when we talk about you know the selectivity at Harvard being ten percent, Wharton being twenty percent, and twenty percent in Indian context doesn't seem like a, a, a super selective process but you, you have to think about 20 percent out of whom right with the group that's applying that's very very selective to begin with i mean mm -hmm. think about people around you and really say how many of you how many folks around you who's who working the same designation have a 740 on the gmat or have had the same career process what percentage of them are applying those are your your it's 20 percent amongst the most selective and that's where the coach really helps get the best out of the talent that you've accumulated till date or the, the leadership experiences. I absolutely agree. Um, I've done about three letter of recommendations for EG Mind employees. Each one of them have worked with an admission consultant. And I can, from my own personal experience, uh, say that, that uh, you know, my feedback with working with an admission consultant on that letter of recommendation, it always turns out to be better than what I would have written by, by myself or for an employee, even though I know that person inside out so so yes i completely agree with you so so with that uh let's kind of go in and do questions and we're going to start questions right from the top um mm -hmm. and and let's kind of start with um mba after 30 over here this is the first question by santosh santosh says can you share some experiences where you've had people with 10 plus years of experience is there a stigma and this is i think let's respond to this question in the indian context because i think that's U.S. context and Indian context. The response is slightly different. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So uh, just to make sure I got the question, Rajat. So the question is... So the uh, question is on your screen, Nupur. It's on your screen. Okay, okay. Uh, so I will just... It says, can you that. share some... Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, absolutely, Santosh. Uh, thank you for the uh, great question. So uh, I'm going to broaden the question and make it more about candidates who have more work experience than we would traditionally see. So anywhere, uh, you know, with like uh, six, seven years or more. So that's how I'm going to broaden the question. So it applies to more individuals. Uh, so uh, definitely what I can share there, Santosh, is uh, the kind of experiences you've had and where you're headed and why you need an MBA, specifically a full-time MBA. It's extremely important to be able to articulate that and also to demonstrate your understanding of the kind of career, the post MBA career that you would be in, and uh, and uh, why you believe that's a great fit. Because uh, many candidates who might be in the same program as you might have, say, five years of experience or even lesser experience, and they might be vying for the same jobs and might also obtain uh, and earn those same jobs. So uh, if I'm a school, if I'm an admissions officer, I'm also looking to understand that you'd be satisfied with that outcome when you arrive at school. Then another factor that becomes a consideration is your engagement within the school's community and, and your commitment to that. Uh, so I think those are a couple of considerations which, which are extremely meaningful. And your ability to demonstrate that you truly understand uh, you know, the post MBA career, what it entails, and you're ready for that, and you genuinely desire that, and, and why that fits in with whatever you've done thus far. I think that can go a long way in the school understanding of motivations and being persuaded uh, by the fact that you've done the research and you have awareness of what the circumstances would be like once you enroll. So really saying is don't be that guy who just wakes up and says, I'm 30 and I now need to do an MBA and then apply to mm -hmm. schools. It has to be a good logical reason, A, as to why yeah. an MBA, why it makes sense now. And then the second piece is, and I think this is the second piece that you mentioned, which is, which is very, which is ignored, is your your ability to contribute to school and your willingness to do so. I think it's a factor we we all ignore. And I personally have been guilty of doing that, I would say. But yes, a great point. Um, so, so that that's wonderful. Um, hopefully, Santosh, that answers your question. Um, uh, just one other piece: you've had two candidates who've been, you know, had ten a decade of experience and who've gotten into schools in the U.S. or in Europe, right? Um, so, uh, I'm not specifically remembering somebody who has ten years of experience uh, necessarily, Rajat. But, but certainly, certainly, certainly uh, north of uh, seven years and mm. and closer to eight and nine as well. Uh, I'm not necessarily recalling folks who have 10 plus years of experience. Okay. Uh, and Santosh, we have had students who have had that. I mean, I, we get exposed to a much higher volume of, uh, greater volume of students. So on our blog, there are a few candidates that, that, that you, uh, where, where you can really look at. Uh, there's a question about your service, Nupur, which is, I know you're very selective in, in uh, who you work with and, and how many candidates you work with in a year. So when do you start taking, doing those, is there a 30-minute discussion that you have? So if you could just mm -hmm. elaborate on the overall process. and Sure, sure. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for the question, Double Whammy. And uh, Raja, thank you for the opportunity. I'm guessing that's a Monica, uh, the uh, <laughs> audience member is going by. Uh, so, uh, so generally, I do uh, take candidates on even uh, in the month of March and February even. However, this year, I have not been doing that. My intention is to... Sorry, uh, when you say engaging. February, I, I just want to interject. For round three or for... For uh, the round intake for fall, yeah. For fall, okay, yes. Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, and and currently for this year, I'll speak to this year. My intention is to uh, commence the consultations again within ten days' is time. That's my intention. Uh, there will be uh, limited consultations in April uh, with uh, with some uh, commitments that I already have. However, with uh, May, uh, I expect those to be in full swing. And my intention is to close uh, the intake for round one, either by the end of May or potentially very early in June. 
So that's the intention. Okay. Having said that, if you're seeing this and you're an applicant, uh, do reach out to check in uh, just in case. Okay, perfect. So so end of May is when you're done with round one and then you open it again and some, for some time in round two? Round yes, two, yes, okay. absolutely. So round round two uh, would still be available even thereafter. So uh, the idea is that just give ourselves three months. Uh, and, and just want to caveat uh, Rajat by saying that even uh, some candidates I might take on even in June, in early June. Yeah. In early June. Okay. Um, there's another question. This is by Bhushan. He says, how to do strategic research about universities that you're applying to? Uh, and how do you, basically, how do you convince a school that you know the school? What are some of the best practices you would recommend? Uh -huh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Bhushan, for the question. Uh, in terms of uh, convincing the schools, I think uh, step one would be just acquiring an excellent understanding of the school and how it fits with your plans. So in that regard, I think something that's absolutely critical is uh, just speaking with as many students and alumni as you possibly can doing your secondary research, which is just, you know, scouring the resources online and, and just speaking to as many people as you can to gauge and ascertain fit and people who have had similar experiences and who are doing the kind of things that you want to do. So I would say there's absolutely no substitute to that research. And thereafter, of course, um, just spending the time on the applications, constantly improving and perfecting them. I think that also goes a long way. Okay, I, and I know uh, I'm going to ask you a question, which is on 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 the spot itself. So, when someone works with you, do you also put them in touch with with your past candidates who are there at top schools, and so that they 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 can get an idea of what it is, what the school's looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the question, Rajat. So, yeah, absolutely, I frequently do that. When people are working with me, I do put them in touch with a former Crack the MBA alumni. Uh, so that they can get a better sense for the kind of experiences that the candidate has had at that school. And, and what I've found is that those conversations can be very, very useful. So that's what I've been hearing from my clients. Oh, I can I can attest to that. Um, from my personal experience, I mean, this year I've uh, interviewed about 12 of our former students on on as a part of NBA Analytical starting from January. And I can say that 10 of them have been super, super active with regards to engaging with the with current and former students from uh, from the target B schools. Um, so definitely also watch some of those interviews. They can really talk about how they approached uh, students through current students through LinkedIn and through other channels as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question is, um, uh, lawyer quarantine says, have you helped lawyers reach Ivy League? Uh, does the background, being being a lawyer, does that work against them in, in any ways? Or does it work for them in any ways? Uh -huh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, lawyer quarantine. Uh, <coughs> and I've, I've certainly worked with a lawyer and uh, I, I will say that uh, the traditionally Traditionally, the definition of Ivy League encompasses only eight Northeastern U.S. schools. So by the traditional definition, even schools like Kellogg, Stanford, MIT, they are not Ivy League schools. So using that definition, uh, I have not Let's helped do Top some... 15. Let's do top 15, right? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, if you talk about it in that manner, absolutely. I have coached a lawyer in securing admission to some of the top global, top 10 global business schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and the background of them having been a lawyer absolutely did not go against them. Uh, in fact, just as is the case with people from other backgrounds, it's about conveying that uh, your your story and why you really really want an mba so uh, you know even as a lawyer you can absolutely do it so uh, just give it your best shot and you'll be in for like a really wonderful journey yeah i, I think lawyers in general they 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 work a lot one on one with clients so i think they have some wonderful stories to tell I, I would say I think maybe as a lawyer, you probably are at an advantage over an engineer as long as your post-MBA goals make sense. I think that's the challenge for you would be the post-MBA goals. But from mm -hmm. a pre-MBA experience, I think you'll have some very fascinating experience if you've been a good lawyer. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I think uh, lawyers would probably be good interview takers as well. Absolutely. 
probably too good. <laughs> 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 you overwork immensely. <laughs> okay. okay, GMAT yeah. versus the GMAT versus the GRE. Um, you know, do schools have a preference in your opinion? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Rania. Uh, so, uh, in my experience, uh, GMAT versus the GRE schools do not have a preference. That's my experience. Having said that, the GMAT is the business test, and having a strong score on the GMAT could be useful if you're recruiting for, say, management consulting. Once you're at business school. So uh, for that reason, if you're agnostic, if you're test agnostic, you could consider consider the GMAT. Uh, but I've also heard of cases where people say that they prefer the GRE. They can do better, they feel. So if that's where you fall, then that's absolutely OK, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the, from a school standpoint, it's not as much of a difference. I think the, only, the two things that I would really say, hey, if you're taking the GRE, make sure you're really good with, with regards to your, your vocab. Uh, because that's what it tests, and 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 um, and you get a really high quant score because I think the threshold for quant may be slightly higher on the GRE because quant's easier on the GRE. Um, uh, but the other piece that you really said, hey, uh, management consulting, really important. If you're going for a corporate strategy role, I remember um, my my second interview out of um, out of my MBA, which is after my first job. The guy who interviewed me had a GMAT score, and I had a high GMAT score even before I went in. There was that sense of respect. So most of the people out there still have GMAT scores, people who are going to be hiring you. So for them, the benchmark is still going to be, be the GMAT. So it does add, I think, a slight advantage on your resume. Um, if uh, so, so, so that's something which is, which is there. Um, uh, but, but yeah, with regards to admissions, probably not a whole lot. If you can get a way better GRE score, you know, definitely go for the GRE is what I would say. Uh, I think uh, we've talked about building connection with the existing students. That's something which is which is there. Um, specific questions. I, I, I want to just look at questions over here, which are, um, this is a good question, I think. A lot of European schools talk about candidates who having this international experience. How important is it for, for European schools? Uh, for, for an applicant. So I think let's kind of define what is international experience? Is it truly being international or is working with folks international who, who are international? Does that also consider international experience? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then sure, the context thanks. of this. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the great question, uh, Ankit. Uh, so when we talk about international experience, um, certainly as Ankit rightly said, uh, many many European schools do value that, and in fact, even American schools do value that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and Rajat, to your point about what constitutes international experience, uh, I would consider that in different levels. Uh, so one level could be where you spend significant amount of time outside your home country. It could mm -hmm. be for academic purposes, or it could be as part of your uh, as part of a job. Or it could be for trainings. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that could be level one in that sense. Then another level could be where you, let's say you've visited for orientations or like a short uh, visit, like be it for like a model United Nations or something. So that could be another level, level two, so to speak. And then another level could be where you haven't necessarily visited outside your home country, but you've been working with people who are located abroad within your home country, uh, be it virtually or when they're visiting. So that's also something that I would consider uh, as constituting international experience as like say level three. So um, I would say all these levels are meaningful because they certainly add value to a candidate in terms of like them being global citizens and them having greater respect for different cultures an appreciation of the same. So I would say that all three levels do matter. So uh, just tap into your experiences and mine them for uh, your in international experiences along those parameters. So what you're really saying is, even if someone's level three, but they're a great candidate, they would, they could, they have a strong chance uh, to get into INSEAD. 
they could have a chance to get in. So I, I, I can't comment on them having a strong chance or not without no, uh, knowing other factors. What I'm saying factors. is if their application yeah. is good, if they have really good leadership experiences, yeah. great team at score, which is kind of okay. what, what this, this yeah. Ankit is asking, right? Yeah. I've not, not traveled internationally, but, yeah. but I've, right? Yeah, so and, I mean, and, and, and I'll deepen that a little bit because Ankit specifically asked about European business school. And I think INSEAD is one that really focuses on international experiences, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have had several candidates who have not had experiences outside their home country, uh, but they've been able to demonstrate international experience through some of these other factors, which has worked in their favor. Yeah. And same yeah. for LBS. Same. Yeah. So don't consider if you've not traveled internationally that these schools are out of your purview or no, no, don't consider that to be the case. Uh, by the way, if you have traveled internationally, but don't have, if you don't have a great profile, then, then that doesn't mean they automatically come in your, in your purview too. So, so yeah, it's, it's yeah. the whole package that matters. Yes, absolutely. So one uh, other question, how much time do you have? I want to just be cognizant of that. We already 10 minutes uh, over our time. No person. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I can certainly extend by another five minutes, Rajat, if that's helpful. Yes, that's good. Round one versus round two, the, the famous debate. Right, right. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Gaurav, uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, I, I think there's certain considerations as somebody's thinking about round one versus round two. Uh, so for some candidates, uh, round one could be meaningful. Uh, and what I mean by that is, let's say you are working at a firm where candidates are disproportionately applying for the MBA, then there could be value in you applying round one because you get an opportunity to be considered along with your peers. Mm -hmm. And not when, let's say, the schools have admitted people with similar backgrounds which could potentially uh, be a slight disadvantage. So, which is not to say you shouldn't do it at all, but it's more just to say that that becomes a consideration when you might actually think about round one. Then another consideration to think about is a lot of times what I see candidates do is uh, spreading their overall list of schools across two rounds. So uh, like applying in both round one and round two, because it's also about the kind of bandwidth you have in applying to X number of schools in one round. And, and in some cases, um, candidates also like to potentially reserve one or two of their top choices for round two, uh, because sometimes they have the view that, hey, we want to apply in round one. And potentially, if there's some learning that we have that something's not working well for us, we want to leverage that and like maybe hold mm -hmm. back on, say, one of those schools for round two. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are some things to think about as you think about round one versus round two. I routinely see strong candidates getting in uh, to schools both in round one as well as in round two. So, uh, you know, definitely don't let that uh, dissuade you. Like, let's say you're in round two and you're watching this video. Don't let that dissuade you from applying. If you're ready to apply, go for it. Yeah, I, I would say when you are ready to apply, apply only then. Don't apply with a 680 in round one if you think you can get to a 740. And a, six, a 740 in round two is way better than a 680 in round one. Because that's kind of what that's kind of limiting people most of the time. So it's the yeah. GRE or the GMAT score. Yes, um, yes. So, so I think that's something which is there. Um, so um, Pooja says she sent her resume to for personalized feedback. Is that a mistake? Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's it's not a yes or no question, but but Nupur, I'd, I'd let you take a stab at it. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Pooja. Thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, I, I really can't comment on whether or not uh, this is something which was uh, warranted or unwarranted without having more information. For example, is that something that those schools had those programs where they were willing to provide feedback on mm -hmm. the resume? Because as I previously mentioned, some schools do have those programs, for example, London Business School. Uh, so if you sent it there, I think uh, that could be a good opportunity for you to actually get some feedback and actually work on that. I've also seen a school like INSEAD do something similar. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it was a mistake. This could actually be an opportunity for you to work on certain areas because I found like some schools to be very candid 
in sharing areas of improvement in a non judgmental way yeah i mean as long as the resume wasn't poorly formatted as long as it didn't have mis careless spelling mistakes as long as it was like an mba resume i think it probably okay i mean as long as you haven't fudged dates or information i think you're fine that's what i would say okay <laughs> cuz that would certainly be detrimental yeah mm -hmm. uh this is uh i don't know if this is a question that that you want to answer but i think it's an a question that a lot of people have which is he this, sanjay has an undergraduate degree from india and an ms degree from the us um uh, so do we need to submit the undergraduate transcripts in the gpa equivalent mm -hmm. sure uh, sanjay thank you for the question and uh, with respect to whether or not you need to convert your gpa to a us equivalent when you're applying mm -hmm. for most schools uh, that's not needed because schools have a strong understanding of different education systems around the world and they have the ability to gauge your performance based mm -hmm. on the the scores as you receive them so just reporting them as is is going to work for you in most cases there may be variations uh, you know for some other schools uh, having said that for most schools it works for you to report it as is when in doubt i would just check in with the specific schools to be doubly sure and, and again i've been far away from this for for a very long time I, the last time i applied to a school was 17 years back but wow uh, yes yeah it's it's been that long so 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 but i think when you're applying giving that percentage scores it's also imperative because especially for some people where 75% means they're in the top 10 in 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 their class to mention somehow that they've been in the top 10 uh which i think because 75% is one thing uh but but being in the top 10 i think is is, is a completely different thing as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely rajat and more often than not schools will have the ability to understand uh, those benchmarks based on your raw scores uh, because there's just uh, such a huge uh, number from india uh, you know candidates which apply and have been applying years after year after year so schools do have that understanding for most universities okay all right i mean there are lots and lots of questions um uh, i i i uh, i i think um we've pretty much answered a good chunk of questions i think if there are questions other questions that you have um then then uh, nupur can people write to you or do you want us to to kind of uh, accumulate all of those questions and and then uh, uh you know we can really send them your way but um uh absolutely but I wanna... absolutely yeah so um Bo so... both ways both ways yeah, work both ways for me work. rajan okay yes absolutely so, so... uh i'll have kartik uh, take make a note of these questions and and then now uh, you can send them your way and um, but i want to thank you for uh, for providing these wonderful insights i also want to thank you for the day of scholarship i'm sure um, our attendees would benefit tremendously one of those well and would get into a top school um, and 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 um, i want to thank you for that time that you've taken out and also want to thank everyone who's joined me today uh, for um, for 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 this um, uh, session um also guys you know please feel free to share your feedback on the session we're doing these sessions for you guys and and your feedback helps us craft these uh, and let us know what do you what do you want to see going forward with schools you want to see what kind of questions you want to see answered so so we can do that as well um yes nupur yeah it's yeah, you want to say absolutely uh, yeah uh, yeah absolutely thank you so much uh, rajat for this wonderful opportunity it's uh, such a great platform for attendees to and applicants to benefit and i really really want to thank uh, attendees for the patience just like patiently bearing with us you know as we bantered mm -hmm. for over 75 minutes and just taking time out to attend this session and the wonderful and thought provoking questions so i really really appreciate this opportunity and the service that eg mat and rajat you kartik and the entire team file everyone is providing so it's really benefiting the ecosystem greatly so thank you so much for the opportunity well uh, you thank you for your time and and for those of you who want to know more about nupur of course go to crack the mba one of the other things is two years ago we did an mba boot camp we have the recordings of that boot camp i don't think nupur you know of that we have an entire uh, uh, microsite with with all the recordings of of, oh, of that boot camp yes and 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 so um, we can we can share that as well so for folks who who write to us 
and um, and yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and once again, we have all of these uh, sessions uh, under MB Analytical. Do register for them. We have uh, uh, the INSEAD session next week, and then the Cornell session post that. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you guys in, in the next set of sessions or so.